Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us at Indaos Live. Um, we are really, really honored and have immense pleasure in introducing our friends at Dimensional uh, who are joining us today. We'll be talking about systematic investing with Dimensional. Uh, we have worked with Dimensional for a long time and we really love uh, what they do. So we are really excited to share uh, Dimensional's perspective, uh, their investment philosophy and strategy. Um, I'm going to just do some announcements first before we move on, move into the meat of the webinar. Um, so just some uh, disclaimers and then please subscribe to the Endow Us YouTube channel and press like so you can go below uh, and subscribe right now as you join us. Uh, we have some wonderful presentations and webinars from internal speakers and external speakers. Uh, we just did a webinar on Wednesday with Greg, our CEO, and myself introducing our new cash and SRS efficient portfolios. Uh, with a bunch of dimensional portfolio uh, funds in there. So um, please go back. Uh, we have recordings, um, so you can watch it at any time in your own leisure. Uh, next week on Monday, we have one with PIMCO as well coming up uh, on fixed income specifically. Uh, but as you know, Dimensional has fixed income product and we've included uh, their global core fixed income product. So we're really excited about that. Um, and following that on Wednesday, we have an investment webinar with our friends at Seedly. Uh, so Seedly is a wonderful um, uh, comparison site, uh, a lot of financial uh, products, uh, endow us reviews, um, and also, you know, they have a lot of great content. So Sudan and Shang-Chi, our personal finance lead, will host that webinar about investment ma mistakes made during this market volatility and past market volatility. So it's more of personal finance presentation. Um, and you know, sharing uh, thoughts and uh, interesting perspectives. So please join us for that as well. Just a quick intro on Endow Us. Uh, we help people invest better so they can live easier today and live better tomorrow and through retirement. We're an end-to-end -end digital platform, uh, direct to consumers, retail investors, and really trying to help individual investors access unprecedented uh, access to amazing products like Dimensional um, and providing advice uh, that is holistic and independent and really in the best interest of our own clients so that they can achieve their financial goals and secure retirement as well. Uh, so our team is a dedicated team of strong um, domain expertise uh, in investments and technology. Uh, our team is growing and it's um, you know a team that is dedicated uh, to the pursuit of fulfilling your needs in finan financial services and wealth creation. Uh, so the three things we're about is access, advice, and cost, independent, uh, unbiased, completely aligned to the client's best interest. Uh, we're about advice, giving holistic advice through all of your source of funds. As you know, Indawas is the first and only digital advisor, advisor for CPF. Uh, so we are the only digital platform where you can invest your CPF, SRS, and your cash savings, uh, working towards a common goal, whether it's you know your life goals or whether it's retirement. And cost is really important, guys. Uh, it's the single biggest drag on returns. It's what prevents a lot of people from achieving good outcomes. Uh, we have no sales charges. Uh, we have innovative solutions to bring fees down, like 100% rebate of trailer fees. Um, you know, we're doing anything we can to reach costs that are that have previously been unachievable. Uh, so we're really excited about changing the way things are done in this industry to improve outcomes for our investors. And we are the safest pair of hands digitally uh, available. So a lot of other robo advisors and other guys out there, but from the get-go, we set up the structure. So we are uh, safe in terms of protecting our clients' assets. So it's in your own client's own name um, with UOBK Hand, which is the largest um, domestic broker. Um, and also we um, work together to bring UOBK Hand into the CPF system as an investment administrator, the first one in 14 years. Uh, so that we can uh, bring costs down and make it a safer journey for you in investing. Um, so these are the benefits of Endow Us, access to institutional class, best in class funds, low cost, globally diversified. Uh, we really emphasize the fact that it's sing dollar or sing dollar hedge solution. So it's matching asset and liability for our clients and not taking on FX risk and 100% trailer fee rebates uh, as well. And it's a personalized curated solution for you many times. So the Endowers journey was, you know, uh, from the get go with the Dimensional team. Uh, Dimensional Funds was there when we began, even before we began. Uh, Joel 
uh, and the team here in Singapore have been a tremendous help in bringing us to where we are. Uh, so we're really excited about our continued relationship. Um, and I think the slides got cut off at the bottom, but we're introducing a whole suite of new dimensional funds that we're excited about. And as I explained, the new fixed income product, uh, which is really exciting as well. So just a quick take on the uh, portfolio. We're enhancing the portfolio's efficiency. That's what it's about. And we're bringing down the cost. Uh, so we're improving H history. Historical performance is not an indicator of future performance. We always know that. Uh, but it gives you some uh, aspects of what the underlying portfolios and the funds are about. So it's about reducing risk at the same level of return or improving returns at the same level of risk, which is the efficiency part, and trying to lower cost at every level. Um, so it's a strategic and passive asset allocation, guys. It's geographically diversified. We're taking into fa account factors, the proven factors of return and the tilts that um, Dimensional is really well known for. Um, we call them the OG, original gangster. <laughs> the original guys who invented the process, uh, perfected the process and systematized it with leading academic research. So they'll go into that detail uh, in more detail. And we really stand on the shoulder of giants like Dimensional. So we really want to emphasize that we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're not trying to build products on new funds uh, because no one can do it better. No one can do it better than Dimensional or any of our partners. Um, and then the final piece is the different components. Uh, this is all on our landing page. Uh, for existing clients, you've received an email, uh, but equities is 100% passive and systematic. It's SGD denominated. Fixed income is either systematic or truly diversified and sing dollar hedged. But all of our funds have access to institution and lowest cost uh, that is achievable. Uh, this is an indication of the historical performance of the various portfolios and uh, the pushing of the efficient frontier as we harvest the classic benefits of diversification and lowering cost. And then, you know, one of the key things is we are introducing a really exciting new product called Pack Basin uh, Small Companies. Um, and it has really the lowest correlation with other portfolios in the, uh, if other funds in the portfolio, very un, un, uh, unusual because equity funds in general have really high correlation uh, with each other, regardless of what asset class or geography it is. But the PAP Basin is a super exciting fund because it has some of the lowest correlations with uh, traditionally um, large uh, asset allocation uh, areas of equity. So that's really exciting for us to introduce. And we have full details about our uh, model asset allocation. And we really emphasize that equities can lose money over periods. Uh, so we show you the worst historical period on a 12 month and a five year, 10 year basis uh, and the best periods as well so that we're fully transparent so that you are aware of the risks that you're taking and find the suitable uh, risk allocation that makes sense for you. Uh, so with that, I'll pass on to, oops, where are the introduction slides? Sorry, we had introduction slides, but maybe we can switch to the dimensional uh, presentation in that in the meantime, I'll stop sharing for a second um, and just welcome um, Joel Teasdale, uh, who's the regional director and VP at Dimensional based here in Singapore. Um, and Wei, Dr. Wei Dai, who is um, an investment professional at uh, Dimensional, also based in Singapore. So we're really excited to have both of you on board. And while we get this presentation slides up, maybe you can just say hi and also introduce yourselves if you, if you like. Sure. Sam, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking with you today. I do have to apologize. I know I have a somewhat glary background and my head is blocking out my... Uh, my wife's shoe cabinet. So apologies for that. It's usually a little more professional coming from uh, from, from um, Dimensional Studios, but I don't have that luxury today. So I hope you'll be able to bear bear with us just as we bring Mine's it Mine's not much better, Joel. Yes, I think it's okay. Uh, you lost the fight too, huh? In your house and where you could give your presentations. Yeah, that's all about being a good father, Sam. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as, as Sam said, um, you know, we have the privilege of working with uh, endow us. Dimensional is a is a pretty different beast in the investment and management industry because um, we, we've never had a business model which is a, about uh, paying people commissions to sell our funds, and that's why we're we're perfectly allowed, uh, perfectly um, aligned with endow us because it's it's an retrocession fee model, and that's been something that Dimensional has always been about, and we've been working with independent fee-based advisors around the world uh, for 30 years, something we're very proud of. And um, I have good fortune along with the rest of the team here in Dimensional 
uh, to, be, to be helping independent advisors uh, take great institutional solutions to Singaporeans who deserve it. You know, it's the world's third biggest financial center and it's terrible that we have to pay so much, right, to get access to good solutions. So we're about trying to change that. We're about trying to give everyone the opportunity to get the returns that are owed to them, which is fantastic. And we're gonna talk a bit about that today. Um, so with me, we have Dr. Wei Dai, uh, who is a um, senior person in our research team at Dimensional. And we're very lucky to have Wei move to Singapore with us a little time ago um, from the United States. So Wei, I might just throw to you to introduce yourself while we're getting our slides together. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me and uh, you know, really good to, to be able to talk to all of you with the help of technology. I think this is going to be a very timely discussion. And uh, about myself, I moved to Singapore uh, last June uh, and uh, I, I'm part of the uh, research team at Dimensional. Uh, you can imagine a lot of my time is spent on getting my hands dirty with data, uh, but then really it's uh, opportunities like this where we talk to our clients about what the research means for, uh, for investment, for your uh, uh, financial planning. Uh, that's really the highlight of, uh, of my day and also highlight of uh, uh, why uh, we do what we do. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Joe uh, to start our uh, discussion. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Wei. Thanks, Sam. We good to go? Yes, Sam? we are. Let's go. Wonderful. Okay, so a bit about dimensional. As I said, we're, we're somewhat of a, a different beast. My wife calls us the Boy Scouts of the investment management industry because <laughs> we're always on the search for truth, trying to find out uh, how markets work and how we can best create solutions that give investors the opportunity of getting those returns that are owed to them. And I use that choice of words carefully because uh, you know the investment puzzle is something that has been around for centuries um, people have capital, they want to invest to create better lives for their families. And it's all around trying to understand what risks are worth taking and what are not. And so that's what Wei and I are going to talk to you about today and a little bit about the history and culture of Dimensional and, and why we like to work with Endow Us. So as a firm, um, we, we're, we're rather large in terms of uh, assets that we manage, but we have a very small number of employees. So we have give or take, uh, you know, somewhere between 450 and 500 billion dollars US of assets under management. I'm not sure exactly what we're at today, given the current volatility with I think markets. It's definitely higher because this was at the end of March. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's been a, a fairly strong rebound in uh, in April and May, um, but that that is that that's part of the territory. What goes with capital markets, and of that of that money, probably about. Uh, Little over 100 billion is invested in fixed income, and the remainder is in in, in majority, uh, majority of growth asset classes and equities. And so we've been at this for some time, um, going on 40 years. Uh, we're we're a global firm. We're operating in um, a, a 13 offices around the world, and uh, and that that grows by the year. But the thing about Dimensional that sets us apart really is is the investment philosophy, um, and that is we have one investment philosophy. We're not about uh, creating products of the day um, to try and meet the demand of whatever the latest phase would be. We're really about understanding the sources of return and trying to make sense of that and put out simple building blocks that our, our partners can use to, to get the returns of capital markets that are owed to them. Now, the, the one thing I think that sets Dimensional apart in, as an investment manager is that we don't try to outguess the market. Okay. We're in the, in the business of trying to create portfolios with higher expected returns than a simple market portfolio, but we try to engineer that without outguessing. So what does that mean? That means using information that's fed into prices every second of every day while markets are open and, and being a free rider, if you will, on all the information that's being put into the market by the, the hundreds of millions of participants that all have some information around the future expected return and risks associated with different companies. So the market is an incredibly powerful uh, mechanism for synthesizing all the information that's known about, about companies and their expected returns. And we're humble enough to know at Dimensional that we don't have more information than the rest of the world put together. So we really focus all of our resources and energies on, on trusting prices. And then by looking at those prices, how we order 
returns over the short term, um, intraday, and over the long term. All right, it's the long term drivers that are going to really affect uh, one's expected return on their portfolios. And it's the short term and the interday drivers where dimensional plays a very big role in trying to engineer good returns by being mindful of cost. We often have a, a, a phrase, we use it dimensional. I hear Wei uh, talk about it a lot. It's, it's in the pursuit of, uh, of more, not, not getting less, right? By taking, by taking silly risks and uh, unwarranted cost, okay? So one investment philosophy, and that's that we trust prices. Not to say that mispricings don't occur, but we don't know how to systematically spot them. So the last thing we're gonna do is guess with your money, all right? So let's move on to the next slide and we'll talk a, a bit about um, the business. So as we said, you know, roughly say 500 billion, 450, 500 billion assets under management. A lot of that money comes from um, independent fee-based advisors, just like endow us from all over the world. And a large part of our business has been working with the independent advisory community whose interests are aligned with yours. It's a fiduciary model where you pay them for advice. There's no conflict of interest. And that lends itself well to the dimensional approach. So we're very, very pleased to see that business grow over years. And, and it's a big part of the reason why we're here in Singapore. And so roughly, you know, 300 or so billion of those assets come from firms just like in Dallas over a range of strategies, equities, emerging markets, globally diversified and multi-asset class, and also fixed income. And Wei's gonna to talk to you, you know, more about that today. Uh, but it started with very humble beginnings and started with an idea of how you can help advisors build a business by really telling the truth around returns and where they come from. So where do, where's the genesis of those ideas? Uh, next slide, please. It goes back to um, our beginnings um, and the academic community that is closely affiliated with Dimensional. So the gentleman who started Dimensional is a, is a man named David Booth. Uh, David is still the executive chairman of the business today, and he's actively involved every day in the business. And you wind the clock back uh, 40 odd years to the, to the um, late 60s, early 70s at the University of Chicago, which at the time and continues to this day to be really the crucible of thought leadership when it comes to security market behavior, asset pricing theory. And it's where, where many of the world's best PhDs go to do the research on trying to un uncover improvements in asset pricing theory. And all asset pricing theory means if I'm gonna take my money out of the bank and invest it in different asset classes, what kind of returns are owed to me? And that's a puzzle that people have been trying to solve for many, many years. And so when David was at the University of Chicago back in the, the, uh, the early seventies, he was a PhD student. He was studying under Professor Gene Farmer. If I could just ask, um, ask us to maybe get the the cursor and just hover it over the left-hand part of the screen on Professor Gene Farmer, if we can. This is a gentleman over here. Uh, it was, Gene was awarded a Nobel Prize in 2013 for, for a bunch of, um, well, a large body of work that he has contributed to asset pricing theory. A big part of that was something called the efficient market hypothesis, and that, that can be used as a starting point to understand asset pricing theory. Now, David as an, was an assistant teaching professor to Gene at the time, um, and many of the other academics on the faculty at that time have become either uh, members of Dimensional's mutual fund board uh, or work with Dimensional on a consulting basis and some have ownership in the firm, right? There are people like Professor Ken French, who was immediately to, to um, Gene's right, um, Professor Robert Merton, uh, who also a Nobel laureate for the contribution he's made to understanding of derivatives pricing, um, Professor Robert Novi Marx, who has um, done a lot of work in understanding the effect of company's profitability and what that should be on expected returns. And then two other gentlemen, which you see slightly to the right of the screen, um, uh, Professor Merton Miller, also from the University of Chicago and a Nobel laureate, and Professor Myron Scholes. Now, these people work with Dimensional on an active basis, some closer than others, um, but we have many uh, many academics in the, in the field of asset pricing that we draw upon the good ideas in finance and try to implement them. The key thing is, is using evidence and not guessing. Now, Way, as part of our research, internal research team of over 100 people, spend all of their time looking through academic papers and journals and data sets and trying to understand what works and what doesn't. 
So really you can think of dimensional as like a filter uh, on all of the hypothesis that is in the investment community around what works and what doesn't, and then trying to engineer to the nth degree portfolios that are designed on um, concepts that work, that are empirically proven, and that are related to asset pricing theory, i.e. what should we expect and what do we see? So no guesswork. So going back to that heritage of, of, of financial science, that's what the firm's been built on. We continue looking for ways to improve the portfolios, and it's only the very, very best ideas that get into our, our, uh, our portfolios. In fact, if you think about a model for trying to build success, you want fewer reliable ideas that work rather than continuing growing number of concepts of the day that may or may not work, all right? And that's a concept I wanna leave you with as I introduce Way to talk about more of those concepts. So at this juncture, Way, I might pause. I might introduce you to talk about what does all this mean? All these models and numbers and data, and how does that how does that link in with prices every day and people's expectations? And I guess more importantly, you know, does it still work <laughs> given this situation with COVID nineteen and the world going into a recession and huge volatility in markets? Is all this hypothesis just poppycock, or does it still work in today's environment? So, to that end, I'll introduce Dr. Wei Dai. Please welcome Wei. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I thought you, you left a, a really nice place. Uh, why don't we just start with the recent market volatility? I think what I would do is to start with recent market volatility, put that into historical context and think about what we should expect going forward. And then I'll talk a little bit about a few uh, fundamental principles when you, when you approach investing uh, and to make sure that you are at least getting that market return, uh, which historically hasn't been a bad place to be. Uh, and then uh, the second part of my presentation will be more focusing on what can you do to do better? I think that, that's what Joe uh, was alluding to. What are the systematic drivers of expected returns that we can harness in our portfolios and how we can implement that in real world portfolios in a cost effective way. And I think this conversation, as I said earlier, is really timely because it's really periods like this uh, with high volatility um, underpins the importance of having an investment philosophy that you can stick with even during challenging times and the importance of having an investment approach that's based on time-tested research and also an importance of having an investment process that's designed to handle all market conditions. So then speaking of market conditions, I think you guys have all seen uh, different headlines about the market, you know, uh, the first quarter one, especially March, has been a very volatile month. Uh, we've seen some really big daily returns on both on the positive side and negative side. Uh, I think there were five, six days above 3% daily, five, six days up below negative 3% daily. So if you put that into context here on the chart, we show the historical distribution of daily returns for, um, for US large cap stocks. You can see that uh, those magnitude uh, it's definitely uncommon when you look at the historical distribution, but not unprecedented. For example, uh, out of the, the historical sample, we have seen 1% of the time with returns above 3% uh, on a daily basis, and 1% of the time when you see return below negative 3%. And we've also seen returns as negative as negative 10% daily, and as positive as a daily of 10% uh, on the positive side. So when you see all of that volatility, how to make sense of that? I think it's really important to keep in mind that uh, it's uh, what you would expect from a well-functioning market. Volatility doesn't mean that your market is, is broken. It's quite the opposite. When you think about there's a lot of uncertainty in the market, a lot of uh, stories unfolding with the pandemic, with a lot of other headlines, you would expect a market to be volatile. So if you look at the next slide, uh, we're trying to show that the market is designed to handle that uncertainty. Just like Joe said earlier, uh, the market is a big, uh, very efficient information processing machine. And through trading between buyers and sellers, information, dispersed information, get embedded in today's market price. So here you look at, for example, in 2019, uh, there's more than $400 billion per day changing hands between buyers and sellers. 
And we see that in uh, playing out uh, in, in recent periods as well. In March, you saw even higher trading volume uh, because of the uncertainty. And why did price change? Well, prices is discounted future cash flow. So market participants may be revising their expectations about future cash flow, right? With maybe with the pandemic, that will have an impact on future profit of companies. And if that goes down, that drives price down. It could also be because of higher risk aversion, because there is more uncertainty and higher risk aversion that leads to higher discount rate applied to those future cash flows, which also in turn may drive uh, prices down. In the end, it's probably the combination of both. Uh, however, I think it's important to know that when you think about those daily returns, monthly returns, there's a lot of short-term noise that may not be that meaningful when you are thinking about financial planning and as a long-term investor. To illustrate that point, if we go to the next slide, simply here we're showing the bars of the annual uh, returns of the market, the U.S. market. Uh, it, you know, some positive years, some negative years. And the whiskers shows the largest intra-year gain and largest intra-year uh, loss. So you can see that those whiskers are much wider than the bars. Uh, so there's a lot of shorter term noise uh, that may be in, in those uh, you know, daily and monthly quarterly returns. Uh, for example, if you look at 2009, um, the largest intra-year decline was about 27%, but that year ended up with a 28% positive gain. So intra-year downturn doesn't mean a down year. And similarly, we saw you know, the, the largest decline in, in this year was probably about 30% uh, when you look at mid-March. Uh, but since then, we've seen a rebound in the market. Uh, and I think right now, uh, year to date, we're looking at about 10% uh, decline since the, the high. Uh, so you can see already some of that loss is already um, paid back from, from the rebound. And also more importantly, when you see a lot of those volatility, how should you inform your expectation about the future? Well, I said prices change because changes in future expectations, because changes in the discount rate uh, apply to those expectations. But it's important to remember that while at prices should the expected return that's embedded in today's market prices should always be positive going forward. And, and that is also supported by a lot of the analysis we did. For example, if you just look at the next slide, uh, we looked at the one year, three year, and five year returns of the market following a market decline of more than 10%. And you see that on average, uh, those returns have been positive about, uh, about 10%. So that really shows that uh, knowing that the expected return should be positive and staying disciplined, staying in the market, is the key for you to capture that higher expected returns associated with stocks. And if we, I turn it around and just say, what, what if you try to go in and out of the market in volatile times? I know it's very tempting to do because watching the market going like a, a, a roller coaster is, is uh, quite, quite scary. Um, I think there it's really about having the financial planning uh, that's commensurate with the risk tolerance that you have. And once that decision is set, then it's important to stick with it. Because trying to go in and out of market may actually make you miss out on some of the really positive returns associated with market and make investors worse off. And that, that's really illustrated in the next slide. Uh, here we're showing in the first bar, um, if you stay invested, market hasn't been a bad place to be. $1,000 grew to uh, $17,000 in that almost 30 year period just miss out on one best day out of that 30 year period. Now your wealth is down by about 10% because on that one best day, market delivered 10%. That's about the magnitude of the average annual premium, uh, average annual return of the market that's delivered, realized in one day. What if you miss out 25 best days out of that 30 year period? Well, now your wealth is down to only a quarter of what you could have got. I think this really shows that, um, you know, because it is really hard to try to have the crystal ball and say when, when the market will be up, when the market will be down, the best way to capture what the market has to offer is to stay consistent focused. And that's what we are trying to do every single day in our portfolios.
Thanks, Wei. I think that's a really important point. And if there's one thing that you can take away from the presentation today and, and why um, I guess there's an alignment of thinking between dimensional and Taoist is that there's just no reliable trigger that you can use that we've been able to find through decades of research that tells you when the equity returns <laughs> should be negative. As Wei says, we expect them to be positive every single day. But they're not always realised. If there was a reliable way to do this, for sure, we'd be doing it. The difficulty is it's so seductive <laughs> to want to know if you a way of, of, of uh, finding a reliable trigger. Okay, And if you could do that, then there's probably a, a really good argument to suggest that this premium wouldn't exist at all. If you, there's one ratio you could look at, it would move um, the risk out of equities, right? And so when you think about the way uh, Endowas builds portfolios, it's through diversifying into other asset classes that don't have the same volatility and are, uh, are perfectly correlated with equities. And in all the research that we've done, and Wei is an expert in this and has, has published many papers on it in terms of trying to understand how you can time the equity premium or different parts of the equity market, it's just nothing reliable. But the good news is you don't have to be able to time the equity premium to, to get great returns. And that's what the rest of the presentation is going to be about. And also highlighting some of the difficulties with traditional approaches that seek to do that. Why well, I'll, I'll hand back to you, but I just thought that was a, a helpful point to, um, to ram home yeah. to the audience. And thanks for advertising some of the research we have done. Uh, as Joe said, we have looked at gazillions ways of trying to time the market, looking at valuation ratios, looking at GDP growth, looking at uh, debt to GDP, interest rate, inflation, mean reversion, you name it. Uh, and in the end, what we find is that investors are more likely to be worse off by trying to you know, move in and out of markets and miss out on those positive returns than staying invested. Uh, and then we will keep looking. And if something that um, really meets our research standard, that would be wonderful to incorporate. But uh, so far, we haven't really seen anything close to a crystal ball. So I guess in, in a sense, I cannot really tell you when the market will turn and by how much, but our expectation is that bearing today's risk will be compensated by, by returns. And along that same line, we talk about how, you know, how impossible it is to try to predict which day will lead you to the best returns. It's the same idea when you think about uh, predicting which country or which stock will deliver the best return. And for that reason, I think Joel mentioned the importance of diversification. So just to visualize uh, what you're working with uh, when you try to predict uh, the best country or best uh, stock, here we have a chart uh, we refer to as the quilt chart that shows every year by column from top to bottom rankings uh, the country level returns uh, from the highest return in that year to the lowest return in that year. And each market is uh, color coded by, by a different color. So you can see there's a lot of randomness in, in the market returns. And there's also a huge range of compounds. So if you just look at the best performing market versus the, uh, the worst performing market and look at the return spread and on average, that return spread is about uh, on the order of 50 percentage points. Um, so that means additional uncertainty that you expose yourself to, which is not necessary if you were to concentrate on just one, one market. Uh, and yeah. By being broadly diversified, then you can get you can get capture that higher returns associated with the equities uh, whenever they show up and wherever they show up. Thanks, thanks, Wei. Just one other thing occurred to me that I thought might be might be interesting and just a bit of fun, and it's purely anecdotal. But I, at times like this, when there's so much uncertainty, everyone's looking for a forecast, and everyone has an opinion, and there's a lot of money at stake. So the <laughs> 99% of other investment managers are going to rush to give you one to try and sell you something. But if you just turn your mind back, you know, to the end of 2018, and you look at the results for 2019, who was long New Zealand, right, in 2019? How many headlines were being written at the start of 2018 about Finland having the best returns or Austria in 2017? So a nice little exercise to do is, you know, we're bombarded with financial media here in Singapore. 24-7, I mean, you can't escape it. You move, you go into an elevator and there's someone on CNBC squawk box telling you what's going to happen next. Write down what the predictions are and let's see what they happen next year, All right? There's a, there's a, there's a plethora of, of country plays and regional plays and thematic plays that are going to be thrown at us right now and continuing during this uncertainty. So 
Uh, just, to, just for a point of fun, I want to encourage everyone to take a note of that and see what happens. Thanks, Wei. Yeah, I think you, you made a really good point and it also shows the challenges of associates with trying to outguess market. Because I'm sure when you look into the media, there's lots of things about macroeconomic forecasts and also indicators coming out. You, sometimes you may find a disconnect, right? Why is the market, you know, economy seems to be going downhill, but yet the market rebounded. Uh, and I think that really goes back to uh, the fact that prices are forward looking. Uh, so it's not really about coming with a correct forecast. That's not even sufficient. It's about coming uh, with a forecast uh, that's different from what's uh, already embedded in the expectation of the market. And knowing that when the market will quote unquote converge to the, the truth that you know. And that's a much, much harder uh, game to play. Just like when we think about the economy, yes, maybe, yes, we are heading into a recession or maybe in a recession, uh, but that expectation is already embedded in today's market prices. So knowing that you are in a recession will not really help you make investment decisions. And if things turn out to be better than what we expect, even though maybe growth is still slower, but even if better than we expect, that could lead to a positive shock to, 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 to prices. So market could go up. So it's really about what, what is going to happen relative to the expectation in that market prices, which is based on the diverse uh, the information that market participants are putting into market. And maybe one more thing to uh, go with this one is about diversification across stocks. It's really the same idea. Uh, it's uh, hard enough to try to predict who is going to be the best performing market. Um, trying to figure out which stock out of, let's say 10,000 stocks is going to give you the best return uh, is, is not really much any easier. So here uh, we are trying to illustrate the, the potential uh, limitations or, or the, the law cost associated with trying to do stock picking. So here, during this time period, if you invest in all stocks, all, all countries, you get about 7% returns. And what if you miss out on the top 10% of performers each year? Now your return is cut more than half, only 2.9%. What if you exclude the top quartile? Now you are getting to a negative return, negative 5% annualized over this long time period. This really shows that, yes, we expect the, the, all the stocks to be delivering that, uh, uh, to have positive equity premium. But in, in any time period, it's going to be a small subset of those stocks that will end up drive uh, the return of the, uh, uh, of the market. So if you miss out on those stocks that end up delivering that positive premium, and you may end up having a portfolio that's not really delivering what the market uh, can, can do. So with that, I think maybe the next slide will be a good summary of what we said, uh, which is uh, market overall have rewarded investors with discipline. So if you stay disciplined over time, and if you stay broadly diversified across market, across sectors, across uh, stocks, uh, then you, there's a much, much better chance for you to actually get that higher expected return. So here we show the growth of wealth of the uh, global market and we overlay that with a lot of the headlines, just to remind people, there's always something going on in the market. People always feel today is different. Maybe something is you know, totally, in the, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in the market. And mark, as a result, market go up, up and down. But when you look at the big picture, when you look at the long term, uh, there is a positive expected return that has been rewarded uh, to investors. So I want to take away with at least two words. One is discipline, one is diversification. And both start with the D. Thanks, Wei. Really important points, guys, because you, you're not going to hear this everywhere. The future is always uncertain, as Wei said. No one has a crystal ball. So you need some kind of compass to help you make decisions. And thus far, all we've talked about in terms of the broad market. In the absence of knowing how to time when to get in and out of markets or how to take overly concentrated positions on securities that might have higher returns, which is a lot of talk of right now. People are trying to figure out who the winners are going to be and who the losers are going to be. In the absence of knowing how to do that on a on a day-to-day -day basis, well, what can you do? Well, that's where dimensional comes in. Um, we talked about market portfolios, you know, the David Booth and Myron Scholes and some other people who started dimensional. 
they built the world's first index fund in 1971, <laughs> right? So we've been at this for a while. The question then is, we know all securities don't have the same return. So what kind of framework can you have that really puts the odds in your favour of understanding what the order of return of different securities might be through time? And that leads us on to the next slide. And so what have we learned over the past 40, 50 years worth of this, this, this trillion dollar you know, question of what stocks have the higher returns? I don't know, how do I not guess? So I'll back to you on maybe summarising how we think about that. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And uh, that leads me to another word. I can start with the D, dimensions. Uh, dimensions of expected returns. That has to do with you know, systematic differences in expected returns across securities. Um, I'm going to start with equities, and then I'll, I'll move on to fixed income. And you will see that it's really the same investment philosophy that underpins everything we do, regardless of the asset class that we're talking about. And in the end, it's about um, extracting information from current market prices about differences in expected returns. Because at the end of the day, yes, we believe markets work. Um, it doesn't, but it doesn't mean that every person should be just holding the market portfolio and, and settle for market-like return. In other words, it will be really odd that all the securities out there have exactly the same expected return. So all, what uh, we spend efforts on is to try to identify those systematic differences in expected returns across stocks. Uh, across stocks, across bonds. So we'll start with uh, stocks. And here you see some of the uh, you know, dimensions that have been um, identified and uh, pursued in our portfolios. But even before going to the details, I'll give you a framework to think about what should be driving expected returns. I think that really sets us apart. We have a framework that guides our research. Um, you know, nowadays with so much machine readable data, so much uh, computing power, really finding something some pattern in the historical data is not that hard. The challenging part is finding something that should expect to work going forward that can add value in real world portfolios going forward. And for that, we really want to protect ourselves against data mined results and by, and by having a framework to tell us which uh, variables should be related to expected returns in the first place uh, is a great way for us to, to protect our, ourselves against chasing spurious results in, in the historical data. Um, I'll try my drawing a little bit. What the framework is the valuation theory. It's very straightforward to understand. It's about the price today. It's the expected future cash flows, CF, divided by the expected. So what I'm drawing here is that when you look at price today, that's what we trust and we'll see every day. It's updated real time all the time. What does that represent? It's the expected future cash flows of the company discounted back to today's value. And what is that discount rate? That discount rate from our investor's perspective is our expected return. That's the ER uh, in, in the denominator. So then what this framework tells us is that the expected return of securities is related to the price you pay and what you expect to receive, right? That's very intuitive to understand. And how do you get a higher expected return? Well, by either having a lower price or by having higher expectations. So the combination of lower prices and higher expectations uh, means higher expected returns. And that really is the foundation behind the, uh, the, uh, the premiums that we pursue in our portfolios. Uh, on one hand, we have some price variables. One is company size, price times shares outstanding gives you the com uh, company size or market capitalization. Uh, lower price, lower market cap, higher expected returns. The smaller cap companies should have higher expected returns than large cap companies. Now, relative price is another price variable. So you divide price by some fundamental variable, say price to book. Uh, then lower price companies, those are uh, rel uh, value stocks, and uh, have higher expected returns than higher relative price companies or growth stocks. Now, profitability is the other side of the coin, right? That's an expected cash flow variable. Uh, so what we're saying is that OLC for firms with higher profitability uh, should have higher expected returns than firms with lower profitability. So you can see that these premiums that we pursue uh, tie very nicely together under this valuation framework, and we should expect them to, uh, to persist into the future. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a framework that is evergreen. And going back to Joe's comment very early on, you know, does it still work? Uh, of course, 
that uh, market is evolving. The economy is always changing. But I would think that the insights we get from valuation theory, that the fact that expected return depends on what you pay, what you expect to receive, uh, should be evergreen. So with that, uh, uh, maybe Joe wants to add, add a little bit on that. Oh, look, just really quickly, why I, I won't get on the road of explaining more about the, the premia of these different dimensions, but we talked about the returns owed to investors. What's the return owed to you? It's return of the market. That's why you can get that really cheaply in a diversified way from you know, some kind of index construction. Uh, that's all we mean. You know, that's, that's owed to investors cheaply you know, for, for taking the risk of equity if you, if you are disciplined and you're diversified. All right, it's the first two Ds. And the next one is, the third D is around the dimensions. And so the puzzle that faces all investors is, well, how do you try and get those better returns? You try and time the market premium or you try and take over concentrated positions. We would say those, those first two are very difficult to do. Um, and so that's then how do you identify these different large groups of securities as why well identify them? That's dimensions of expected return and equities of fixed income. That's what we're specialists at doing and where the higher returns come from. So way maybe you can talk us through those a bit more detail and the kind of, you know, volatility that's associated with these things, even though we expect them every day. We're getting, we're getting a lot of questions about this. So let's go into the meat of this. This is the part everyone's Good. been looking for. Great. Good. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yes, uh, you know, so far I've only talked about the framework and what the prediction of valuation theory is. So then uh, what we bring to the table is, uh, you know, research. Yeah, the, we need to look into the historical data to see whether, yes, whether we do observe these premiums in the data. And more importantly, how volatile these premiums are, what's the magnitude, what's the proxy to, to use for, for our investment process to capture those premiums, how they interact with each, each other. All of those are uh, what requires uh, in-depth research. So with that, I'll turn to the next page where we show some, some historical data supporting the prediction of the valuation theory. So from top to, down, uh, to, to, top to bottom, uh, we're, we're looking at the uh, size premium, relative price, and profitability. Um, so we, from left to right, we're looking at uh, data for, from the US, developed X US, and emerging markets. So in each of the bucket, what we show is the two gray bars shows, uh, for example, let's start with the top left corner. Now we see that, uh, the annualized return of a small cap index is about 11.3% over this sample period. And the annualized return of a large cap index is about 9.9%. So then what's the difference? That's 2.02%. That's the measure of the size premium, which we show in the blue bar. And if you look across these premiums and look across markets, the main takeaway is that, yes, uh, the, uh, the, the prediction of the theory is confirmed by, by historical data. Uh, we do see that these premiums are sizable, are positive, pervasive across markets. Now, I think it, a more important thing to, to ask is, well, you show me a 2% size premium in the US. Does it mean that every year I'm going to get that 2%? Absolutely not. It's just like how we think about the market. A market gives you a, a positive expected return and a, a a good return over the long term, but there will be up and downs associated with the market. And similarly here, there is a volatility associated with these premiums. And the next slide is probably one of the slides that we use all the, uh, most frequently, which is really to help us understand the behavior of the premiums and also to, to help investors set expectations uh, when you think about pursuing these premiums. So here we're looking at uh, four premiums. So the first one is the market premium, stock versus uh, you know, short-term bonds. And then uh, the next three are the size premium, value premium, and profitability premium. The bars shows the annual real realizations of these premiums. The blue bars means these premiums were positive in a year. The, the red bars shows these premiums were negative. So you can see that there are definitely more blue bars than red bars, uh, but uh, there's the underperformance of these premiums can definitely happen. And sometimes that underperformance can last a, 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 a period of time, uh, multiple years. And for that, I think we often look back to the equity premium. Even with the equity premium, you have seen a prolonged time periods when equity underperform treasury bills. However, that doesn't mean that equity premium is broken. 
it's really the negative manifestation of the large range of outcomes that, that we have known all along. Thanks, Wei. And just to, just a point there again, um, very conscious that Endowis is a new firm in Singapore and the dimensional's only been available to, um, to members of the investment public through Endowis and a small number of other firms very recently. But seeing sustained periods of time or any dimension to underperform is nothing new to us. Okay, so you go back to when the firm started back in 1981, all dimensional did was, was pretty much small caps, right? US small caps and, and some fixed income. And then uh, our client base was very well educated, large uh, US institutions around the world buying us for exposure to small company premiums. And as Wei was sort of highlighting, uh, when we launched the fund, that small premium itself wasn't there for the best part of a decade. Did that question our, our, our belief in the theory and the data? No, you just didn't get the realized premium that came for a significant period of time. Value has been absent by itself as a, as a single dimension cumulatively over the past decade, not every year, but cumulatively. It reminds me very much of, of the late 90s where people were questioning that again. And so the, the spurious nature of when the, the premier decide to turn up, it, it's why you want it, why I was about to talk about the importance of being diversified across all of them. And individually, that can go long periods of time. A quarter is noise, a year is noise. And if you speak to a lot of people in the academic community, they'll tell you a decade is, is noise as well. And so when we think about investing in equities, you know, I could be, you know, based on life expectancy tables in Singapore, I could be, I could be in my, my, my mid 60s and still have 25, 30 years of investing to go. So if, we're, if you think you have a, a time period for investing in equities, we think the, the reliability and the persistency of the premium on size, value and profitability is a, is a pretty good um, bet to take if you want to bet away from the market. So if you're happy to look different from the market in the pursuit of more, then we think these are very robust and reliable premia to use. And that's why we build portfolios around them strategically and don't try and vary them through time because there's just too much noise. Again, there's a lot of opinion in the investment community on people's ability to do this. We can't find anything reliable. It's in our interest to want to do it. But we, we don't see it. And so that's why we don't do it with, with our investors' money, with your money. Way back to you. Yeah, similar to the comments I made about timing the markets, you know, we have done a lot of research on timing these premiums. Uh, in the end, we haven't really found anything compelling. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I could say that there are maybe some historical uh, data and historical strategies that could work. Uh, I can actually think about one, which is timing the Italian value premium using a mean reversion uh, technology and then using a, a particular set of parameters. And, but that's one out of almost 800 strategies that we tested uh, historically. So, you know, we really need to understand that some of these good results could just happen by chance. And if I just cherry pick those numbers and cherry pick those strategies and say, look, I found something that worked really well, um, I, I would be really being not honest with, with my research and myself. So I think, uh, you know, that's partially why I really enjoy working at Dimensional in, in, because it, it is okay for me to produce and, and report and write on negative results. Um, and then and I think really on timing the premiums and timing the market, uh, you see the, the vast majority being negative and we just don't really see compelling evidence. Now, that being said, we definitely recognize that there's a lot of volatility associated with the premiums. So when we design the portfolios, there are many things we can do to, to, to try to mitigate the impact of a negative premium and uh, to, to make sure that even when the premiums don't show up, we're still left with a broadly diversified, low cost, low turnover portfolio that we can be proud of. And first of all, uh, the first thing to do is to be, you know, stay consistently focused on the premiums. And that's shown through the next slide. Uh, I showed you the one year um, annual, uh, annual observations. Now, what if you look at the 10 year premiums? And now again, rolling 10 year periods, now you see a lot more blue bars. So the longer your holding period, provided that you are consistently focused on those premiums, then the better chance that you will get that positive premium. Of course, the, the, the pro probability will not go to 100%. Uh, for example, with value, there's a one six cents uh, uh, chance uh, the 10-year value premium may be negative. 
And with the market premium, that's about uh, the same as well, maybe one in six. Um, but the probability definitely increases and the odds is increasingly in your, uh, in your favor as you look at the longer term and as you stay disciplined. And then the other thing we do in our portfolio, which Joe already alluded to, is to integrate multiple premiums. If you look on this chart and look across the columns, there are very few years uh, when these premiums are all negative together. Um, so that means by relying on multiple premiums, by having multiple sources of value add to, re, uh, to, to incorporate into your portfolios, your reliability of outperforming the market also increases. And that's what we do in our portfolios, which is illustrated uh, in the next slide. It's a diagram showing that what we are trying to do. Uh, you can imagine these balls to begin with are all of the same size. That means, okay, these are all market uh, cap weighted. That's our market portfolio. And we said it's not a, a, it's a good starting place for people thinking about investment. And then what we can do is sort uh, stocks based on market capitalization price and based on profitability. And jointly, they will determine which stocks have higher expected returns, which stocks have lower expected returns. What we do is then to systematically tilt um, towards the directions with higher expected returns. So you can see on the chart, some balls become bigger. Uh, those are the overweighted stocks. Those are stocks with a smaller capitalization, uh, lower relative price, and higher profitability. And then those stocks with lower expected returns are underweighted uh, in, in our strategies. And that's the construction we use uh, in, in all of our, um, uh, in, in our portfolios to make, multi, to make considerations around multiple premiums. And with that, maybe I can turn to the next page um, to think about how you incorporate research into real-world portfolios. Now, first is to know that, to, to know that uh, right now is probably the best time ever for, for investors. It's so cost-effective with the evolution of the market and technology, you can access uh, a global market in a very cost-effective way. And what we do is then, depending on the region, uh, the segment of the market that you're interested in, we can apply our systematic approach to pursue higher expected returns. Uh, whether you say you want developed markets or maybe you want emerging markets or you only want large caps or early on, uh, I think Sam talked about a uh, Pacific, Pacific region of pack, pack basing. Uh, so these are all different flavors of uh, the same investment approach applied to different uh, segments of the market. So maybe I'll turn to Joe to give uh, everyone a quick run through of the funds available. Sure. Thanks, Wei. Um, do you want to do that, or should we take a pause and take some questions? Do you, or do it very quickly, quick, Will? Probably a good juncture to take some questions, and then we can we can uh, address those, and then and turn to a few of the strategies. Uh, yeah, sure. Sean, do you mind not sharing? I just want to share a couple of things with the the audience because we're in, in the process of answer, answering some of these questions. Um, I just wanted to share a few slides. This slide actually wasn't there. Um, sorry, this slide. <laughs> so I think, you know, to Wei's point and Joel's point about, um, you know, dimensions, um, I think people use the word factor a lot and keep asking about factors. Uh, but think about what equity premium means, um, because that's very commonly used and everybody uses that term. But then they shift to factors when they talk about things that may drive performance. So I think it's really important to understand that dimensional is focused on the dimensions of returns, which are persistent, which are sensible, pervasive, robust, and cost-effective to you know, actually harvest those returns, right? So these are premiums. So it has to be consistent and persistent over time and long periods of time. So only those that are proven premiums are the ones that Dimensional really uses. So I think that's really important to understand between factors and premiums. And the other thing that I think is really important is that you have to understand that, you know, dimensional is passive. It has broad market exposure. It's not like the factor guys who buy only a, 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 a you know, a, a momentum factor, you know, or only the growth factor. They own like 25 stocks. So it cannot be a diversified market exposure, but dimensional owns the whole market, but it tilts it towards the proven factors of return. So it's harvesting the premiums, but it's giving you broad passive exposure to markets as well which is very, very rare in this day and age. And they do it systematically at extreme low cost, which is really exceptional. And 
offering that to individual investors at the kind of prices and the cost that they're uh, making it available to is also something that you know astounds me at times. So I think it's really important to understand those concepts. But this is a chart that I want to answer because a lot of questions about S&P 500, great index, you know, it's done fantastically well. Uh, and you guys didn't put this in, so I'm going to put it in here and share with you guys. But guys, you have to remember just a decade prior, post the, you know, the tech bubble bursting in 2000 and up to 2009 even, and immediately after the financial crisis as well, the S&P lost a decade of performance. So during a period when emerging markets was up 162%, and IFA, which is the developed market as a whole, was up 36%. S&P 500 as an index was negative 9%. So not even underperformed or you know, gave you less return. It lost money for you during a period when the global market actually went up. So I think you, you have to understand that this time frame of a decade being just a noise that Joel mentioned earlier is actually true. Because you know we may be at the end of a decade, we may be you know we may see S and P extend its performance. We don't know. We're not in the business of predicting, neither in Dawas or dimensional. But I think it's really really important for investors to understand that just what's done best in the last decade is not going to be the one that did the best, you know, in the past for long periods of time, and it may not be the one that does best over the future as well. So that's why being passive. And you know, broadly diversified globally, geographically, and across the different factors of returns or dimensions of returns, sorry, <laughs> um, is really, really important. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. And maybe we take a couple of questions, guys. Uh, maybe Sean, you can have the slides back up so that we can be ready. Uh, but you know, the obvious one keeps coming up, guys. So, you know, is it possible to understand when a certain factor will stop working? Uh, could you give your thoughts? And this is a really sophisticated question. Could you give your thoughts on Farmer and French's recent paper in early 2020, which observed that size and value premiums seem to have reduced in the last decade? Uh, the, the final question was a, a general run of the mill question, but the fact that the, he searched up a Farmer and French recent paper um, is, you know, really uh, impressive. So if you can maybe touch on that, I mean, we touched on it a bit in the presentation, but maybe specific to that question. When, when does it work? How do we know? Um, and stuff like that. Sure. Um, why, why don't you give me 15 seconds of introductory framing on this? Because there's a million ways you could go. And then I'll let you, let you dive into the details. So uh, Gene Farmer and Ken French collectively have written hundreds of papers. They put them out all the time. They're very um, popular guys, by the way. Yeah. Right. So they're the two promo cited uh, um academics in the field of asset pricing on the planet and they're still working <laughs> every single day. What they're trying to do, right, is break their papers and find better ways of improving returns. And that's what Dimension was all about. And if you if you go through and have a look thoroughly at all the work that they've done progressively in, in the, the recent work, their, their opinions remain unchanged. The last decade worth of returns through, through value doesn't tell us anything statistically different about what our assumptions were before that. For the same reason that Sam just meant, you know, the S&P went, <laughs> went missing for, for 10 years. Okay, there's a very short periods of time from a statistical and analytic perspective in terms of uh, inferring anything about that. And that's the way I would encourage you to think about it. But to, to do justice to the question around, the, um, around uh, you know, what other insights you might be able to draw from the paper, I'll throw it to Wei because she answers these all day. Thank you, Wei. Yeah, I'm glad that the, you know you uh, brought up this paper. I think really gets at the volatility of the premiums and also uh, you know some at the heart of statistics, which by the way is my major back in PhD. Uh, which you know just to think about visualize it. Uh, let's think about let's say the value premium that's drawn from a distribution like a bell curve distribution. There is a expected return, expected value of that value premium. Uh, but then there's a lot of uncertainty around that expected return as well. So you can think about uh, every month or every year, um, the, there is a realized premium that's drawn from that expected return distribution. Now, of course, when you look at different sample period, uh, the point estimate or just the, the sample average will be different because there's a lot of noise in, in that distribution. And the, ultimately what Fama and French tried to answer in that question is that uh, is those, are the averages different enough 
for us to conclude that now they are coming from two different distributions, two different bell curve distributions with different expected length. That's what they are trying to figure out. And what, if you uh, look into the conclusion of the paper, what they find is yes, in more recent period, we've uh, seen a smaller uh, premium on average, uh, but that's not enough for us to reject the, the hypothesis that they may be actually coming from the same expected return distribution. And they, they in fact actually recommended what people do if you want to inform an expectation about the future, about the magnitude of value premium, they, they think that using the longest history possible uh, may be a more reasonable way to do because then you have more data points. And because by looking at two half uh, sample periods, you really don't see compelling evidence that these two uh, are reliably different. And internally, we have also done some research uh, looking at for the same sample period, let's say the, the latest uh, 28, period, uh, 28 years, I think that's what they're looking at uh, in the US, but we looked at developed back to us and emerging markets. So over that same time period, uh, value premium was reliably positive in developed back to us market as well as in emerging markets. And if you try to check whether the premiums are reliably different between these regions, for example, US very different from developed or US different from emerging markets, you also don't see uh, evidence rejecting that. So meaning that um, the best way you can go about uh, Forming your expectation is to think that these premiums are probably similar. Uh, we don't really see evidence that the, the magnitude is different. Uh, so the best way is to be broadly diversified across all markets to, to capture those. Hmm. Maybe one other question about, um, so this is a question. Uh, so thank you, AS Yak and Serging for those questions. But this one's from TLM, TLM91. Could Dimensional share, how do they ensure that the portfolios minimize factor loadings to other unintended or undesirable factors, and he and he specifically says such as momentum. So I think you need to <laughs> explain momentum, but also you know other unintended or undesirable factors. So it's a little bit of a question on systematic implementation, and uh, we have more questions about implementation. So I, do you want to do you want those questions now to answer it together, or I think this is a good one. Okay. Um, it's a really good one. Uh, again, I'll, maybe I'll give ten seconds of framing, and then because you could go anywhere with this in a way you can talk specifically about the bar we, we use and, and why, how we think about momentum. Um, everyone's looking at the same set of data, dimensional universe Chicago and looking at it for a long, long time. And people can draw different conclusions from it. There, there's over 300 supposed factors that people have looked at that say produce have normal returns. And then we try to focus on the ones that we think uh, give you the, the most benefit by combining the least, which subsume the rest. Uh, and that's a way in the research team think about all the time is, is there additional benefit to adding in the latest so-called factor that's going to improve returns on after a net of fees basis? Because you don't get this for free. You've got to trade every day. And you look at turnover to try and make sure you can engineer that. So Wayne, maybe you can talk about the bar that we use and why we focus on six and not 312. <laughs> and then um, specifically how we think about momentum. Is it a dimension? Is the work of a long period, short periods, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, well, I think we've got a very knowledgeable audience, you know, from our French paper and now Momentum, all of these things uh, that, you know, uh, very glad to hear these different questions and see how people are very informed on. A different Sorry, wait, can we, before you go yes. on, could I mm -hmm. maybe ask that, um, because most people just focus and think that Dimensional only does value, you know, size and quality. So maybe just explain that you consist constantly looking at factors that are working um, and are proven and you're applying all of them. And so, you know, what are those? And, you know, just maybe lay the grounds before you go into the details. That'd be great. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah, absolutely. I'll start uh, first on, you know, basically at the res uh, research, when, when we think about our goal, uh, you know, one important goal is to stay abreast on, uh, about the latest research in the academic community. And then what we do is then to apply our judgment and our experience to understand that what research can be promising for real world portfolios? Because there, well, some papers may be just not, you know, best ex executed. So the re results are not that robust or, or interesting. That's one part that you filter out uh, immediately. But then there may be some papers that are quite interesting uh, by itself, but may not have a lot of implications for real world portfolios. If it's something that's only concentrated in a tiny, tiny segment of market, 
or uh, in a lot of times that may be already uh, subsumed by the premiums of what we already pursue. So what you see is that a lot of times it's uh, supposedly a new thing, but it's really a repackaging of, of old things. Uh, so for those type of research, uh, they are also not very useful for our uh, real world portfolios. And then for the research that uh, may be promising, then we will bring in in-house to do a lot more research and to, to see. And then we are constantly um, you know, enhancing our portfolios and adding additional things uh, to, to going after every basis point. You know, some examples include, uh, for, well, maybe to, to give you examples, I will give you the first the framework. You know, what are the things we do consider in our portfolios? Uh, it's not just the size value probability that I, I introduced earlier. Uh, those are definitely the most important because these are the long-term drivers of expected returns and they, they will uh, inform our uh, asset allocation decisions at the portfolio level. So that's the portfolio design. But there are also variables that tell you something about the shorter term expected returns. Uh, so for example, tell you something about expected return over the next few days or next few months. Uh, so momentum, uh, as uh, raised in this question, is a good example of that. Uh, we see in the data that uh, stocks that have outperformed their peers tend to outperform in the next uh, few months. So we do consider that as a short-term uh, short variable. And another example being uh, securities lending. Um, so if uh, you, that's another type of market price that you can observe uh, you know, through our you know, lending our securities to, to other people. Uh, if people are and you're driven by supply and demand again, uh, if people are willing to pay a very high price to borrow stock and maybe to short that stock, that says something about the expected return over a few days. We do see that those uh, very expensive to borrow stocks tend to tank in the next few days. So we consider that in, as a short-term variable as well. What we really don't want to do is that to treat short-term variables the same way as long-term variable. It's a simple way to say, oh, let's just combine all together. But that's not a very thoughtful way. Because if you go after those short-term variables directly, uh, because they are shorter term and information decays quickly, that means you need a very high turnover to, call, uh, to capture those premiums. In the end, you may not end up really actually getting that premium after cost. So for us, we will consider those shorter term, uh, yes, the cost effectiveness uh, is super important. So uh, in the end, what we do is on a daily basis, when we think about buying and selling stocks, we will consider both long-term and short-term uh, considerations. So going back to the question, um, you know, the exposure to momentum, we wouldn't consider, it's not unintended. Uh, we will uh, have exposure to momentum, but with a more uh, thoughtful way. So for example, on a given day, if there are two different value stocks that I want to buy more of, and one is in downward momentum and one is not, then we will buy that uh, one without downward momentum on that day. And we will reevaluate it again next day. If the downward momentum dissipates, then we're happy to buy this one. So this is really the importance of having a daily process that moves as fast as the information does, that allows us to, in, to incorporate short-term information as effectively as possible. Um, and lastly, I would say that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I think it's a really good point about uh, not having unintended exposure. At the same time, it's also important to think about not offsetting your exposure uh, unintentionally. Uh, because when you think about these premiums, they all interact with each other. If you just do a simple combination of a, you know, one third small, one third value, one third high probability, you may end up offsetting those tilts because small value firms tend to have lower probability, not higher probability. So that's why when we integrate the premiums, we consider the interactions that to make sure that we're pursuing those premiums in an integrated way that does not lead to offsetting tilt. Yeah. Um, say one thing about this as well, because I think just two, because there's different spectrum of audiences as out there. Sure. So we're going a bit too deep sometimes, but okay. just on this, uh, because passive, what does passive really mm -hmm. mean? I think, you know, uh, it's, a, it's basically about not being selective. Um, so some people think that passive is, you know, buying an index or buying an ETF, but we clearly know that some indexes, which are man-made, um, dimensional users indexes too, um, you know, S&P 500 is an index, but so is a robotics index or a China tech index. So just because you're buying an ETF doesn't mean you're passive. Also, just because you're buying an index, you're not passive. What passive means is having broad diversified exposure 
and not taking any active decisions about shifting those allocations over time. So I think that's something that is really important. And this global passive exposure is really important. And as Joel highlighted, the world equity funding in Dimensional is the most diversified passive exposure with over 11,000 stocks in there. What we've built in this new portfolio is a replication that has you know, almost 10,000 stocks with the three dimensional funds that we have in there, developed market, emerging market, and impact basin, uh, small companies. So we've replicated a very broad diversified asset allocation across geography and passive across 10,000 stocks. Uh, the MSCI all country index has 3,044. So you know, that, that's the most you know, passive index that everybody uses, but even that is only a limited portion. If you buy S&P 500, you're buying only that 54% in this chart, but not all of it. You're only buying that largest 500 stocks. If you buy STI, yeah. and I have to make it into a localized context, if you buy STI, <laughs> there's a lot of local biases. Uh, I'm sorry for Singaporeans. I love Singapore. I've been here 15 years, but Singapore doesn't show up on this index because it's less than 1%. Um, so putting all your eggs in one basket of STI, even if it's ETF, and even if it's indexed, you're not being passive. You're not being diversified. So STI is um, one of our friends, Lou, who who's the leader of the 1M65 movement, calls it the super terrible index, <laughs> STI. <laughs> but um, right. it, it is yeah. from the perspective of long-term financial planning for individuals. You cannot put all yep. your eggs in one basket of STI. So I think that's that's a really important thing that I wanted to highlight before we move on. Yeah. Sam, look, it's a great point. I, I won't spend too much time on the other strategies, but... Merton Miller, who was one of the uh, founding directors of Dimensional and associated with the firm since the start, Nobel Prize winner, he always said diversification is your buddy. Okay? Capitalism only owes you return if you buy everything you possibly can, right? And you, you collect the returns in aggregate for what the market delivers. If you, if you start expressing opinions on individual countries or regions or, 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 or geographies, then you're speculating, right? So when you... So we go back to the, the, the start of Dimensional, the guys, David Booth and others who built the world's first index funds, there, there weren't indices around often in those days when we started these products. So we were just going out there and buying large quantities of assets in a really diversified way. And to us, that was passive because you weren't expressing an opinion on the market. You weren't trying to guess. You're saying, I just want the returns from that part of the market. And an index itself is nothing more than a scoreboard for active managers to beat. It's an arbitrary construct. So when we think about the, getting the, the returns from equity markets, we're going to be as diversified as we can. We buy the high world or you buy all the developed world or all the emerging markets or, or as, as much as we can. And then within that universe, it's about every day overweighting those securities that should I you higher expect to return in a systematic way. Sometimes it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. But that's the second D, <laughs> discipline, right? And we talk about discipline, it's like, well, not discipline for a, a month or two months or three years. It's for an investment lifetime. And when, when returns are disappointing or not what you expect, that's when the discipline kicks in. Right? And I think that's a lot of what we're going through at the moment. And that's why uh, in Dowas employs us with your money to do exactly what we said we'd do, which is to maintain a disciplined, dispassionate exposure to higher expected return securities. And they are higher expected return. They just haven't been realized over the last year or so. So that's, so that's no, there's thanks, one Sam. more question maybe that's appropriate for now because it's about systematic implementation. Um, it's basically about cost and then also uh, using an ETF, for example. So I know you guys uh, discussed ETFs and have launched it in the US. So that's something maybe you can just touch upon very briefly, uh, but also about cost. How do you get to implement it at so low, low cost? Um, you know, and uh, you know, people have asked, what are the fees? Is it, you know, better ETF or unit trust? But you've been able to achieve really low cost as a unit trust. And I know that you guys eat some of that cost internally so that you can provide mm -hmm. the lowest cost solution to customers. And we love that about you guys. So if you can maybe, you know, do a little bit of uh, PR on that front about how you <laughs> systematically implement it at low cost and then how you, you know, provide the fund structures at low cost as well to customers. Sure. Uh, well, way how about I kick it off again at a high level and then fill in the blanks. So um, whether you're an ETF, whether you're a, a mutual fund, a dimensional can do both and does, does both for different people. It's about trying to get the maximum return 
focusing on the energies in the right areas at the lowest cost. And so Dimensional has a history of as the scale of the funds grow, uh, driving down the cost at every, every turn, wherever we can, whether it's in trading by employing, we have about somewhere between 22 to 26 traders around the world that sit on our P&L that we pay so they can get better execution prices and throwing out orders to the market like a lot of other people do, because often brokers don't act in the, the best interest of, uh, of, of funds. Um, second thing would be uh, custodians. We squeeze down custodian prices just as Endow Us tries to do to make sure those, those prices get, get less and less. And then as a management firm, we know we want our, our fees to be as low as, as they can be that are economic because it makes our performance hurdle less, right? So wherever we can pass on returns by having less employees, by employing uh, resources only when we know they're going to make a difference, by rigorous research into uh, the way we trade, the way we build portfolios, the way we participate in, in corporate actions, every single basis point counts. And we continue to do that. And the big reason why we, the costs are so low is because we don't spend money on any activities we think are not adding to returns, like trying to make macro calls or guess which security is mispriced or not. Because the, what history tells us is that, you know, that cost is permanent, but it doesn't always relate to higher expected returns. So only spend money on what we have to. And then when we do, spend it on the, the, the uh, focus on delivering those high returns, which are the dimensions and our ability to execute to get those well. Well, maybe you might add, add a few other things there. Yeah, I think the flip side of that is when you look at a lot of active managers, uh, you know, trying to outguess market prices, and that's an arms race. You have to employ a lot of, you know, analysts and do a lot of field trips and uh, try to get information, uh, get an informational edge, and that's very costly to do. And then when you look at their performance, they're not able to deliver outperformance net of cost. And so our approach is more systematic. We think about cost-effective uh, implementation, and we have the economy of scale. And also, for example, when we do trading, um, you know, we only pay for the, the service we, we need to, which is you know, getting access to the market. We don't really buy, say, research reports from the brokers, which many managers may do. Uh, those are all you know, important uh, aspects. And then I think in the end, also, when you think about how we run the business, uh, you know, thinking about where we should spend most of our resources is at the heart of how we run the business as well. Um, you don't really see us, uh, you know, running advertisement in on, on TV or in uh, MRT. Um, we, we've relied on organic growth, which we are very proud of as well. Uh, guys, uh, I didn't realize the time had gone so much. I think the individual funds, we don't actually have to cover it unless you really want to. Yeah, I think we, we've no. spent on this is the more important stuff. And it's where I think the interest of our clients are most centered. Um, understanding dimensional and the investment philosophy and strategy. So it's been fantastic. Maybe, uh, maybe one last question about, um, you know, back testing framework. This one's a specific one as well from a client. Um, they're asking about, you know, the back testing framework for institution, you know, dimensional and whether, you know, you remove some of the skews that exist. Uh, what are the kind of the variables of back testing if you do back testing at all is kind of the question. So is that, um, okay, so look, I guess Wade's the, the expert here. Yeah, Again, the it's not really about backtesting. It's actually, you know, how do you look at the information uh -huh. that's out, real information that's actually there, yeah. Okay, uh, so way I, I guess the two things in my mind that we have, like everybody else, you know, there are indices, um, they give you an idea of um, how broad groups of securities have behaved. That's interesting. Um, they, you know, they're not real portfolios. The question is then, you know, how can you use prices every single day to make sure that you can get the best return from those group of securities without out, out guessing or, or wasting money? So why maybe you could think about, give the, the, the uh, audience some thinking about how we, how we build data series and how we build funds and how we use prices every day to make sure that they're uh, the best representation of the premium we're trying to deliver. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, I think there's probably two aspects of that. One is, okay, when we uh, run our portfolios on a daily basis, you know, how to, you know, what information we use. And then uh, I think more related to backtest, you know, we definitely also look at historical data for doing research and, uh, you know, how, how we approach research that way. Uh, so more on the daily investment side, I think uh, one thing to 
to realize is that prices change every single day. And that means that uh, expected return potential also changes. So that means if you want a portfolio uh, that's uh, you know, capturing the, the expected return in the most effective way, you need to use the latest information possible. So for example, when you think about size value profitability, uh, those price metrics are based on real-time price. Uh, that's what we use. You know, market capitalization changes when prices change, price to book changes when price change. So we want, we have a, um, you know, a, a, what we call IAD group, so investment analytic and data group, which is really in charge of the ecosystem of the, how the data flow. So they go all the way from getting data from different vendors to, um, you know, doing data quality checks to in integrate them into a system that can be used for portfolio managers and traders to make investment decisions. Uh, and then uh, for variables like profitability, those are based on you know, regular uh, uh, income statements. So those are not you know, updated every single day. Uh, what we've tried to do is to use, again, the latest uh, reports possible. Uh, and then if there are uh, changes in the companies that may lead us to believe there may be material changes that we should be uh, you know, aware of, then we will do uh, a, a more systematic way to examine that data points. And then we may uh, choose to freeze that data points until we get more clarity about it. So even on the uh, data points that do not uh, update every single day, uh, we, also, we also pay a lot of attention to, to make sure that the, the data we use are comparable across uh, stocks and are, are representative for our investment decisions. Uh, and then, for, for example, when you think about shorter term variables, we use momentum. Again, that's based on returns and prices that, uh, that is real time. Uh, and then securities lending prices, uh, that's uh, you know, based on our securities lending activities where we get from our lending agent on a daily basis, the real, again, real time prices of uh, securities on loan. And that is another uh, data points into our investment process. And then when it comes to trading, uh, we, uh, we monitor the daily liquidity of the market, the bid ask spread, what's the potential uh, cost associated with trading stock. And those are a lot of the market microstructure data uh, that we, we feed into our system as well. Because when you think about our global portfolio, you know, 40 plus um, countries and many more exchanges that we're interacting in. So having all that data integrated into our system is important. And with that data, we implement our proprietary trading algorithm that's deployed through, through, uh, through the brokers that we work with. So those are all the data points that we use. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. No, thank you, Wade. That's We're great. in for equities. We didn't, we didn't yeah. start on fixed income today. <laughs> There's a few other interesting, fun questions out there, but I think we're kind of out of time. Um, one last question from one guy. With all the benefits explained, do you guys personally invest all your investable personal money into dimensional funds? Um, so I'll answer first. Endow us, all of our employees invest in Endow's portfolios, which is predominantly made up with dimensional funds. So the answer is yes. Um, so I don't know what it is for dimensional employees, but I don't yeah. know. Yeah, look, I'm happy. I've given my personal experience. I had a whole bunch of securities that I owned before uh, joining dimensional. Um, I was told if I wanted the job, I had to sell them if I believed in the story, and which I did. And all of my investments are in dimensional dimensional funds other than uh, property that I own in Australia. I own a house, I've got dimensional. That's all in dimensional. <laughs> My family's in dimensional as well. So, yeah, 100% believe in it and couldn't do this if I didn't think it was the right thing for me at least to do. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, for me, uh, yeah, I guess also a yes on my end, you know, uh, especially in the US, I have the uh, 401k where I can access dimensional fund in a very efficient manner. So that's uh, where I, I have a lot of my investment with dimensional. Uh, and then, you know, some of my money is also tied up in, in a, a, you know, purchasing house in, in, in the US. So that's, you know, on the side of the other okay. So apart from my house, I have house all, in all, Singapore. Of our, <laughs> all of our money is in dimensional and in Dallas portfolio. So yes, the answer is yes. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to end with a fun note, just some, um, Final comments from any anybody to wrap up? No? Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna do some housekeeping announcements. Uh, once again, please subscribe to Endow Us. Uh, we'll probably have a recording, maybe not the whole thing, uh, but we'll have a recording of this hopefully up on the YouTube channel as well. So if you like us and follow us, it will pop up automatically. So you can actually receive it. 
Uh, and then obviously we did the webinar last Wednesday, uh, Greg, the CEO of Indawas and myself on investing cash and SRS efficiently. Uh, and then next Monday, we have a fixed income focused uh, session with PIMCO. And then next Wednesday, we have a session between Sheng Shi, our personal finance lead and our seed lead content lead, Sudan, uh, who's great. Um, so this is really interesting, fun topic as well. So please join us uh, next Monday lunchtime and then next Wednesday evening as well. Uh, with that, I really want to thank uh, Joel and Wei and the whole Dimensional team. Um, we've spent time with the founder, David Booth, uh, to the co-CEOs, uh, to every leadership who have been so supportive throughout our whole journey in trying to change the way investing is done in Singapore. So we really appreciate everything that you guys are doing. You know, the commitment and the support that you've shown Singapore is truly amazing. You've you know gotten new licenses, you've gone through hurdles, you know, you're trying to get into TPF and all these things that you guys are doing is just tremendously, you know, really heartening uh, and encouraging. And it's for the benefit of every single investor in Singapore. So thank you once again, guys. And thank you for joining today. Thank you, Sam. Absolute pleasure. And uh, we'd be happy to uh, come back at any time if there's other things you'd like us to talk about. And to everyone else, thank you for your time. We are trying to make a difference here in Singapore. So I wish you uh, a happy weekend. And we'll keep working hard for you. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And um, you know, if you have any follow-up questions about Indawas, because today was very specific to Dimensional, we missed a lot of questions that were specific to Indawas. We want to give plenty of time to explore and understand um, and really, truly appreciate uh, Dimensional today. Uh, so if you have any questions on Indawas, please reach out to uh, our reps, our licensed representatives. And also you can email support at indows.com or go to our website indows.com uh, to find out more about us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. Bye.